Hiya guys, Buildzoid here, and this is going to be a sort of uh, follow-up video to the Z490 roundup video I did for Gamers Nexus. Um, and so basically, the, the thing is, is that video covered a very short list of Z490 motherboards that I think are sort of like the number one boards you should consider in their various price categories. But the thing that like I'm actually kind of annoyed about is in the, uh, so, so this video is mostly going to be focusing on covering boards that almost made it onto the Gamers Nexus video, and uh, it's also going to focus. And, and the other thing is that I forgot to mention in the Gamers Nexus video that basically with Z490, because like believe it or not, I actually don't have that difficult to meet demands for motherboards. So with Z490. Um, basically, any motherboard from Asus, MSI, or Gigabyte that costs $200 or more is a good motherboard. Now, if you're ASRock, you don't know how to make a proper rear I.O., and you're also cutting corners on the power, actually, you're just kind of cutting corners on everything. So, you know, ASRock didn't make it into that, that like, because the, the only good Z490 ASRock board is the Tai Chi, as far as I'm concerned. And the Tai Chi is so expensive that it's like, but you could also buy a Unify or a Z490e, or like so many other boards in that sort of price range where it's like, and it's, you know, like some of them might be $40 more, some of them are $60 less, and in my opinion, it's like, well, so, like the board, do, the board is nowhere near competing with the boards that are $400, and the board is also not that much better than the boards that are $300, so it's like, so why would you get the Tai Chi in, in considering that, like considering that? Um, and then the rest of Azrock's lineup is just generally not great, in my opinion, but uh, and we're not going to get into why. But uh, yeah, so what did I want to... So, but, but the main thing is, for Z490, $200 motherboard or more from Asus MSI Gigabyte, good board. Um, you know, like, it's really, like, it, it is that simple. And I know that covers a huge amount of boards, but that, that like... I don't actually have that high demands for motherboards. It's not that difficult to, you know, check off every demand Buildzoid has when it comes to, to making a motherboard. And with Z490, basically everybody has managed to do just that. Um, you know, and I've always preferred sort of more expensive motherboards, so it's not really surprising that it starts at $200 instead of all the way at $150. But, uh... Yeah, but anyway, so now we're going to go through the, the board, but yeah, so like there's a lot of good Z490 boards, but here we're going to go through the, the list of the Z490 boards that didn't make it into the list that were very close to it, and then some boards that just didn't make it into like, the, basically a selection of boards that I, I thought, uh, wanted to talk about based on some of the comments I saw under the Z490, uh, under the Gamers Nexus video, and also just some of the boards that, you know, were on my list but didn't make it. So... The Z490 Aorus Extreme um, did not make it into the list because this thing has the exact same feature set as a Z490 Godlike from MSI, but it's $50 more expensive and it doesn't have a safe boot button. And that's it, actually. That's the, ma the main reason why this didn't make it is because this doesn't have a safe boot button. And, um, you know, the one thing that this does that's like better than the Godlike, in theory, is that this has SMT DIMM slots because everything else this board, like the Godlike does everything else this board does. And I'm serious about that. Like Gigabyte's like, oh yeah, we got tantalum polymer capacitor array. It's like, well, the Godlike has literally the entire output filter made up of SMD. Because uh, the th important thing isn't the tantalum polymer part, it's the packaging that they're SMD capacitors. That package style has far lower ESL than your through-hole capacitors. So these are far better at suppressing the voltage spikes and dips that a CPU produces as it does CPU things. But a but the, the godlike literally has the entire output filter made out of SMD polymers. So it's like, yeah, uh, do doesn't... Uh, doesn't really count, um, in my opinion. Uh, you know, with the, like, well, like, th this isn't a good reason to, to get the extreme instead of the godlike. Then it doesn't have safe boot. And the only thing that's really special here is the SMT DIMM slots, right? Where you don't have through hole DIMM slots. And this can help with memory overclocking. How much? I don't know. Um, I, this is something I plan to test. But the issue is Gigabyte is currently, like, pushing constant BIOS updates that keep improving, like, memory compatibility, memory overclocking, GPU compatibility, like, a lot of things that they're 
they're kind of fixing right now after launch. And so it's just really awkward to, to like recommend a motherboard on, you know, memory overclocking performance that is out of date within a week. And ultimately, I don't think this, like, I'd be very surprised if this board was, like, more than 200 megahertz better than the than the MSI Godlike if you were running a 4x8 configuration. Now, you might say, what about a 2x8 or a 2x16? Well, if you're running a 2x16, uh, this is probably going to be terrible, at least based on my experience with 2x16 on some gigabyte, other gigabyte Z490 boards, because... Uh, uh, well, it might just be, well, no, those DIMMs do 4266 on MSI, so doing 3866 on Gigabyte is not okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, um, 2x16, the, you're gonna lose to an Apex, 2x8, you're gonna lose to an Apex. So basically, if you want 2 DIMM memory overclocking performance, go get an Apex. This board could be really interesting for, like, 4x8 and 4x16 configurations, maybe. Right, and it's like, but you know what else is really good at two by eight, and I mean four by eight and four by sixteen configurations, or well, I've not tested four by sixteen, but four by eight, God likes pretty good at four by eight. Like, I mean, the even the regular Unify is pretty good by four on on four by eight, and the God like just adds two more layers to that topology, so you know it's not going to get any worse. Um. And yeah, so the extreme just kind of didn't make it because there's no safe boot and there's not really any major advantage for the extreme over the godlike. And also, um, Gigabyte not having safe boot, in my opinion, is a bigger problem than, say, an MSI motherboard not having a safe boot because MSI boards, especially on Intel, are really good at recovering. Like, they will fail your settings so quickly that it honestly like the sometimes the fail like the fail set is saving you like you know seconds it's not like some boards having fail set saves you a lot of time other boards like msi boards it barely does anything because the boards will auto fail so quickly anyway um so yeah, but gigabyte boards and eight, like actually most boards that aren't MSI in my experience have a tendency to be pretty try hard as in if you punch in settings that don't work, they're going to get stuck in a boot loop or just get stuck on a postcode forever and they're not going to recover and you know, it's super annoying and you wish you had safe boot far more with a motherboard like an extreme or really any gigabyte board or any Asus board, like, you'd really want a safe boot button. With MSI, the, the fail set button is like, ooh, that's nice and convenient, but honestly, you're, like, it's not even that necessary. And so, yeah, it's like, that's why the Extreme didn't make it. It's $50 more expensive, there's no safe boot button, Gigabyte's BIOS recovery is generally worse than MSI's. This might be slightly better at memory overclocking, but I'm not going to put a memory, uh, I'm not going to put this board into a, uh, you know, general roundup that I, it goes up on Gamers Nexus. Their audience is quite a bit more casual than mine. I'm not going to be recommending a gigabyte board to, like, a, this board to a more casual audience. Like, you know, if you're going to be buying a board this expensive and you're casual, you will want safe boot or fail set or something like that. This doesn't have that, um, you know, and it's a really cool board from a hardware perspective, like the SMT DIMM slots. I'm a huge fan of that. Like, there's a lot of, like, if I judge this board within, like, my own internal criteria, I think it's, this is a really cool board. But I also think the Godlike is really cool, and the Godlike's also probably more, like, actually, not even probably, it's definitely more user-friendly. So, MSI got the recommendation, and, and this didn't, because... Like, and it's not, at this point, it's not anything physically wrong with the board. It's just, like, Gigabyte make your BIOS less annoying or something. Which, like, I can live with Gigabyte BIOS. It's just, like, I, I just run into people so frequently who just, like, Gigabyte boards are, like, you need to know how, like, you need to know how to use a Gigabyte board. If you don't know how to use a Gigabyte board, it's very frustrating. Um... And with, with MSI boards, like, they require mu much less, like, they're m far easier to run. So, yeah, that's why the Extreme didn't make it. Next, EVGA Z490 Dark. One, this thing isn't released. Two, um, this is basically the same, pr like, this board runs into the same problem, in my opinion, as the Extreme does. This is like an Apex, except uh, $150 more expensive, and... Uh, 
well, yeah, that's that's kind of that. It's like a more expensive Apex. It might it might be somewhat better at memory overclocking than, than an Apex. Actually, it probably like it should be better at memory overclocking than an Apex. But the problem is, Asus puts a lot of polish into their motherboards, um, mostly in the department of making them ex like extremely obnoxious of, to use. But they are very capable. And the thing is, is just. Like, this thing, like, I, I don't, like, I, th why would you get this instead of an Apex, in my opinion? Like, I wouldn't use this for a daily build, um, really. And, yeah, so, because the thing is, I'm judging this based on my experience with the Z390 Dark, because I've not yet had a Z490 Dark to test, and, and the Z390 Dark is, like, it's really good, um, if you have the right set of memory in it. If you run, like... You try to run Micron memory on the Z390 Dark, like, it's terrible. It's absolutely the worst thing I've ever done. You try to run dual rank memory, um, it's, well, depending on what dual rank memory, it's honestly not great either. Like, the board is really good at running 2x8 and nothing else. And it's just like, well, at $550, I would like my motherboard to be capable of doing you know, more than just 2x8. Um, and the thing is, like, the board is super, like, I, I I just, yeah, and at that point, I was just like, like, get an Apex or get a 4-dimmer or get literally anything with, with more flexible memory support at that point, in my opinion. Like, the Dark is a really cool piece of hardware, but again, it's just kind of like, this is a more collector's item type board than, like, if I was stuck with only a Dark, um, I'd be kind of annoyed <laughs> for... <laughs> for for it's not like the x299 dark is actually surprisingly flexible but i'm going to assume that's because the x299 memory controller is much better than the one you get on z series chipsets right like the the skylake x memory controller far far more ca like one t command rate on skylake x works not because of some crazy bios optimizations but because the memory controller is just better than what you get on on z series chipsets that's why like 1t command rate on z390 and z490 is 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 such a like it requires a lot of bios like specific bios optimizations from the motherboard vendors in order to work properly whereas on x299 it just does because x299 is awesome like that um but uh yeah, and, and so, you know, like, I, I wouldn't recommend, like, the, the Dark wouldn't make it onto, like, even if this was released, it wouldn't have made it onto the list, because this just feels like a board where, like, there might be, like, 20 people that watch that video who would actually appreciate having this board, <laughs> in my opinion, who could actually take advantage of this board, right? Whereas there's probably, like, even with the Apex... I feel like far more people would be capable of, like, one, you, you save a bunch of money getting an Apex instead. Two, um, it's just going to be a, easier to run motherboard. Also, like, it, it's just going to be an easier to work with motherboard because Asus boards are just a bit more polished. And that's just down to the fact that EVGA is absolutely tiny when it comes to, to motherboard motherboards compared to Asus. Anyway, also 18-phase VRM, so... The thing with EVGA phase counts is that EVGA counts like a bunch of minor rails into their overall phase count. So uh, I'm going to supports up to 64 gigs of memory at up to 4600 plus. I am not aware of any 32 gig dims that go anywhere near 4600. So I'm going to assume supports up to 64 gigs of memory like that at shouldn't be be there like it should like 4600 plus on 2 by 8 2 by 16 eh, 2 by 16 should be able to do 4600 plus but again like it's super bios dependent and it's like if the bios doesn't know how to do it then it doesn't matter how good the board is um so yeah, I'm. I'm not like. Ultimately, this is this is kind of like an even more extreme version of what the problem that the the Aorus Extreme has, in my opinion. Moving on, Maximus Twelve Formula. This is a weird board because it's like it's got the VRM off of the Apex, so there's no iGPU power. There's no way to use QuickSync. Um, it has the uh, it has 10 gig LAN, 
but most of the bo like otherwise it's basically a maximus 12 hero so it's like so you take a maximus 12 hero you remove quick sync the igpu functionality completely you just get rid of that you give it the vrm of an apex and you give it 10 gig lan and it's and now it's 500 dollars more expensive and it's like you know what i might just buy a hero and a 10 gig lan card instead <laughs> You know, because that actually works out to roughly the same cost. And guess what? If I do that with the hero, I'm still going to have my IGPU. And it's like, so, yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of the reason why the, the, the formula. And the funny thing is the formula almost made it into the list. But like this was the closest board out of all of these to make it into the list. Because actually it got cut in Steve's edit. Like when Steve was editing or whoever was editing the video at Gamers Nexus. I think it might have been Steve. Um, they were the ones who cut the formula out. Because I actually had the formula in the list. But it got cut because it, the video was just too long. Because they want 30 minute videos. But um. Yeah, the the thing is is just like this is a hero with no IGPU support and ten gig LAN, and it's just like um, I'd rather buy a hero then. <laughs> and some people might be like, but you get the VRM water block. Yeah, that doesn't do anything. So that like having a VRM water blocked, it's just wait like that. That's just a waste. I'd rather have the IGPU support instead of the VRM block. Um, Anyway, moving on, Z490 Aorus Master. So this didn't make it onto the list because this is $380. And I mean, honestly, most of the $400 boards were really hard to justify because the MSI Z490 Unify exists. And the main main thing is like, okay, so things that this board has going for it, really nice power delivery, um, right? We have all of the tantalum capacitors and, and that. But the thing is the Z490-E already from Asus has a VRM that looks very solid. Um, and that's a $300 board, right? Basically, in my Gamers Nexus video, it was the Z490-E and the Unify that got the recommendations. And the the if you want a very capable VRM, then, like, this, this doesn't need, like, this VRM is more efficient. Like, that's not the issue. But in terms of, like, at some point, you hit a level of power delivery where going past that just doesn't really make much of a difference anymore. And with the Z490E and the Unify, well, especially the Unify, like, we've already hit that. So spending more money isn't really going to do much. And the the thing is, that with, uh, with when I was testing Z390... Right, like the Z390 Dark was the best VR, best motherboard for transient response by a little bit of overshoot. Okay, so it had a slightly less overshoot, which is less important than undershoot than the Maximus 11 Gene. The Z490E has better power delivery than the Maximus 11 Gene did. So, uh, um, yeah, like, I don't think the extra tantalums that Gigabyte, like, because Gigabyte has added a bunch of tantalum capacitors to this. Like, those are cool and all, but I don't think they massive, like, they're not going to push this board from being able to run, you know, like, th these might make 10 millivolts a difference. Maybe. You know, I'd consider, I'd be very optimistic if they did made 10 millivolts a difference. Um so, yeah, it's just, like, I, I don't see, like, VRM-wise, already with the Z490E, you probably have all the transient response you want. In terms of overclocking features, the only thing this really does is give you dual BIOS, right? Which is just, like, um, I don't know, like, it also has better rear I.O. than the Unify, but it's just, like, like, this is not a bad board. It's just a board where it's like, I'm finding a real, I'm, ha I'm having a really hard time justifying why you should get this instead of the Z490E or the Unify. Because with the Unify, you get fail set. And fail set is amazing. And the only real thing that it's like, yeah, you could get this instead of the Z490E or the Unify is because this has dual BIOS. But this is also $80 more expensive. You know, and at that point is like, well, maybe you're willing to give up dual BIOS for 80 bucks. Right? Because I know I am. <laughs> like, I have no problem with giving up dual BIOS for $80. Like, it's a nice feature to have, but, you know, how frequent, like, it's not something that I, I ultimately care about that much. The most important things for me are having a postcode, you know, having, a re like, a clear CMOS button, which, honestly, even not the clear CMOS button is just, like, you can wire up your case's reset to the clear CMOS jumper. That works. 
right? Um, not my idea, somebody suggested that to me, but yeah, you can just wire up reset to clear CMOS. Bam, you've got a clear CMOS button. Amazing, isn't it? Um, and it's available on the front side of your case where it's far more accessible and, you know, yeah, awesome. So ultimately, like, postcode's nice, dual BIOS nice, VRM is nice, but the Z490E already less efficient, but nice VRM enough anyway. And uh, memory overclocking-wise, I'd assume the Unify probably is about the same as this, maybe slightly better, may, or maybe in certain ways, may, you know, the like memory overclocking is really hard to judge um, for now. Maybe in a couple months I'll have a really good idea of which board is actually the best memory overclocker, but for now it's like the BIOSes are still really early for some of these boards, and there's constant updates changing memory behavior, so... Yeah, and ultimately, like, this is a board I really wanted to squeeze into the list, but I just couldn't think of, like, a justification for it. Like, that was literally it. Like, I was like, I want the master on the list. Why would I put the master on the list? It's like, well, the VRM might be a little bit better than the Dash E, you know, by 10 millivolts. Nobody cares about 10 millivolts, me included. <laughs> and the dual BIOS is nice, but it's $80 more. It's 80 bloody dollars more, and it's like, you know, and I guess Gigabyte wants to compare it to the Hero, but the Hero has 5 gig, like, has 2.5 gig and 5 gig LAN, and admittedly, most people probably won't use the 5 gig for anything ever, right? Or they'll, like, they're not going to use the dual LAN functionality at all, but it's still just like, but, you know, if you're not, like, if you don't need the 5 gig LAN that the Hero comes with, then you could, again, you could just buy a $300 board instead. Um... So this board is just, like, super hard to, like, this This is, yeah, it's just super hard to justify buying this compared to a $300 board. Like, honestly, this is hard to justify even compared to the Z490 Ultra from Gigabyte, right? Because, again, you $80, you still get a decent enough VRM, um, and, you know, like, $80 less, you still get a solid VRM, you lose dual BIOS, but you still have the postcode. It's like... Well, that's not much of a loss at all, if you ask me. So, yeah, anyway, next board. So this, I, like, this is a board that I'm very interested in because it does some cool things. So we have SMT DIMM slots, right? So memory overclocking on this could be really good. It could also be terrible. You never know, but it could be really good. Um, it has such a cool feature set. So this board, because the thing is, this is $330. You've got the postcode, power button, reset button, safe boot button, dual BIOS. Like, this ticks off all the features for, like, overclocking. But EVGA safe boot is clunkier than Asus, okay? Like, Asus by far, Asus, well, fail set from MSI is also really nice. But safe boot on EVGA, um, because of how EVGA handles their, like, LN2 overclocking support... Um, their safe boot button does not take you down to, like, stock settings with elevated voltages for cold bug removal. It takes you back down to the last known good. The problem with that is, is the last known good can often end up being an incredibly unstable memory overclock that's just stable enough to post. Um, and I know this because I've had that happen on the Z390 Dark on several occasions, and it's not fun. So I'd rather, like, so EVGA safe boot is not, in my opinion, on par with Asus safe boot. The other issue is, but, you know, the overall, but it's still safe boot. It's still nice to have some form of safe boot. So that would have already, like, been a really nice thing to have in a $330 board. Then you, of course, have the dual BIOS, which is really nice. You've got the postcodes, nice power button, like, really nice feature set. And then... You, you just get to, to this part where we have 14-phase uh, digital VRM design. The problem with this is EVGA counts phases really weird. And so if we look at the board, we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 inductors for vCore. I mean, in the vCore area. And if we look at the rear I.O., we have display outputs. Therefore, logically, the GP, the motherboard has to have iGPU power. And the iGPU power plane for the LGA1200 socket is in this area up here. So this probably has at least one phase of iGPU power, which means the vCore can only be a 10, 
And then it's like, okay, so is this a 10 using 50 amp power stages? Or is it a 10 using like 70s or something? If it's on like if it's on like 70 or 60 or 90 amp smart power stages, this would be a great VRM. And I wouldn't have a problem recommending this board. But I don't know that. So like, I don't know what the specs are on this uh, VRM. If it was on 90s, especially I, like 90s or 70 amp smart power stages, I'd, I'd recommend it in a heartbeat. But uh if it's a 10 phase of 50 amp power stages, then at $330, it's like, nope. <laughs> like, absolutely nope. Though, it does have really nice substantial heat sinks. Like, this is a really nice board, in my opinion. It's just like, what exactly is hiding under those heat sinks? Is a, it's a very important question that I'd like to see answered, because the feature set here is amazing. Just the VRM, and also the memory overclocking is like, this is EVGA. Their track record for ro like memory overclocking, in my opinion, is not that great. Um, as in flexibility, like they can do some incredible things in specific memory configurations. But for a daily system, you want a motherboard where you can kind of stick whatever the hell you want into the DIMM slots and it works great. Or at least works somewhat well. Which is what MSI generally tr manages to do, where it's like you can stick basically anything into their motherboard and it'll work okay. You know, it may not be the fastest, it may not be the lowest latency, but it's not going to be an absolute disaster like some boards where you stick a certain kit of memory into it and it's like, oh yeah, uh, uh, now you're stuck at 3600, thank you very much. <laughs> it's just like, what? <laughs> and the thing is, EVGA here is only advertising up to 4400 plus, which is like, that is not that high. Uh, especially considering the SMT DIMM slots. Also, I can't tell what memory topology they're on. Like, it could still be a T, like, this might be on a T topology, which would be really interesting for 4x8. Like, a SMT DIMM slot T topology, like, this is an interesting board, but ultimately a motherboard I do not feel, like, this is a board I'd have to test in order to be willing to recommend it. Because it's just like, yeah, I, I have no idea what, how, how this actually behaves in general. Anyway, um, also, I wanted to check the QVL, but... Oh, they, they have one? Wait, memory. Um, memory compatibility. Oh, yeah. The, so this is what? 8, 16, 2. Wait, what? 2 plus 4. That's 44. That's 4,000. That's 4,000 again. Yeah, so this. Oh, there, there we have one G skill kit that goes 4,400 dim. 2 plus 4. Oh, I guess it has to be a daisy chain then. That's kind of low for a daisy chain. Like, 4400 is pretty low for a daisy chain. Also, these all look suspiciously like B die. They, they, wait, well. No, I'm pretty sure that's still, oh no, that's CJ, that's DJR. Oh, I guess they might have DJR. Well, I don't think they have a higher speed DJR bin anywhere. Like, generally, for Z490, DJR should clock, like, absolutely ridiculously well. And so it's like, so why is there no, like, super high-speed DJR anywhere? That is weird. So, yeah, basically, EVGA's memory support is just a case of, like, you know, it could be really good. It could also be kind of disappointing, and... I, like, I wouldn't want to, like, the, the thing is with, with especially, like, MSI, their memory support is just absolutely incredible. Like, you can stick basically anything into their boards and it'll work okay. And then with a lot of the other vendors, it's like, you need to be kind of careful with what you choose. Because some of the times the BIOS just has no idea what to do with the memory sticks. And then life sucks. So, anyway, but this was a board that I really, like, thought could, like, this... This could get into a, a like a future recommendation list if if I get a chance to test one. Um, anyway, um, Z490 Aorus Ultra. This is another board that I kind of wanted to get onto the list, but the problem is this just like I like so this is a true 12 phase VRM using 55 amp power stages of some form from Vishay Semiconductor. I'm not sure about the specific parts like. I've seen some gigabyte spreadsheet which says it's on SIC 620As, but I also know for a fact that there's a mistake in that spreadsheet for one of the other boards. 
Um, and also, those aren't 55 amp DR MOS. Those are like 60 amp DR MOS. So it's like, uh, what? But um, yeah, so I'm not sure what specific power stages this is on yet. And um, the the thing is, is like it has a postcode. So this is like a Z490E essentially, but the PCIe slot layout is more limited than what you get on the Z490E from Asus. And that's basically it. Like other than that, it's like, it's super similar to the Z490E. You also get the tantalum polymer capacitors inside the CPU socket, which that's great and all, but ultimately I don't think this is gonna make like, I don't think this is gonna like massively make this board like 20, 30, 40 millivolts better than the E at CPU overclocking, right? Like that would be like, if it did that, if it was 40 millivolts better at CPU overclocking, then hell yeah, I get the ultra no matter what. But I doubt that like the, the problem is like there's a CPU socket between you and whatever capacitor bank you put on the motherboard and the CPU socket kind of sucks. <laughs> So, um, for power delivery, like, it really sucks. And and that's not, like, an LGA-1200 problem. That's just CPU sockets kind of suck at power delivery because you've got pins which are literally just touching the CPU, which you can kind of see how that's not the most reliable way of delivering power to a chip, right? Like, hoping for some pins to, to make good enough contact. So... Yeah, and so the issue is, is like, so I don't think this would, like, make this board massively better than, than some of the competing boards in, in like, Undershoot. Maybe Overshoot. Like, this might have amazing Overshoot, but it's like, Overshoot doesn't matter in the first place. So it's like, like, that that's kind of the thing that, you know, you see it on the oscilloscope. It makes your peak-to-peak -peak readings really ugly, but at the end of the day, it doesn't affect overclock stability, basically, at all. As long as it isn't so high that it's potentially damaging the silicon, but, you know, like that I don't think like I, I'm not sure how high it would have to be to do that and I'd assume it has to be very high because I've had like well I've measured overshoot up into the like 1.8 volt range and not like chips are fine um even with like settings that a lot of people would reasonably run is like you don't hear about people suddenly having chips die because of uh of uh like running really flat llc with a relatively low voltage because that gives you horrible overshoot and it's just like yeah you don't really hear about that you normally hear about people killing chips with electro migration whereas overshoot is a concern for like dielectric breakdown um dielectric breakdown which not really like like that the voltage requirements for that i think are far higher than just some 1.x something volts um so yeah so the Ultra was like, if if the, like, the thing is the Dash E has more power handling capacity than this does, slightly. Um, and I don't think this is going to have a significant transient response advantage over the Dash E, and then it has a slightly worse PCIe slot layout. It has the same rear I.O. in terms of USB ports, and it just doesn't do anything that the Dash E doesn't do. And at that point, it's just like, but the Dash E has, more, like, you know... Yeah, so that, that's why the Ultra didn't make it. Then we have the $250 boards. None of these made it for the very simple reason that they're all the same and essentially not that different from the $200 boards. Like, the Z490 Pro AX compared to the Vision G, like, the biggest difference you get here is that this 16x slot, instead of being PCIe 3.0, is now PCIe 4.0, which is like, hooray, who cares about that? Also, I guess it adds Wi-Fi 6, but if you wanted Wi-Fi 6, you could get the MSI Z490 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi, which has Wi-Fi 6 and is $50 cheaper. It also has a admittedly inferior VR, like not significantly inferior VRM. Like if I was just recommending boards based entirely on VRM criteria, then Gigabyte would basically, Gigabyte and Asus would be sweeping uh, a very large chunk of Z490. Um, but, uh... I'm not. I'm actually considering these boards from, you know, like, d do they actually do things that I like to, like, do they do things that a motherboard should do, like allowing you to connect stuff to the CPU? Because mainly that's the, the, the whole point of your motherboard is to connect things to the CPU, right? And it's like, so I was basing criteria like how many PCIe slots do we have? Do we have, you know, USB ports, LAN, like networking options, that kind of thing. Um, 
I wish I could comment on audio sections, but I don't test my onboard motherboard audio at all. So it's like, I don't even have any, like, I just, I'm not willing to comment on that basically because I, I don't have, like, I don't pay attention to onboard audio at all. So I'm not going to try judge boards based on it. Um, yeah, like there's nothing wrong. Like if you bought a Pro AX, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just like, I'm surprised you didn't just buy a, buy like a Z490 Elite or a Gaming Edge Wi-Fi or a Vision G or like, why didn't, like, I'd like to love to hear the reason why you didn't just buy a $200 board instead, you know, assuming that they were in stock <laughs> because that's, it's always an option that the board wasn't in stock, but yeah, um, and then the Carbon, like, the same problem, like, why wouldn't you just get a Gaming Edge Wi-Fi instead, right? Like, this doesn't even do anything to the rear I.O., this is the same rear I.O. as a Gaming Edge Wi-Fi. The VRM, I think, is, oh, the VRM on this is an actual 12-phase, and they added a heat pipe to it, but it's like, um, well, that, that's not really gonna make, like, like, it's still on the same power stages. It's not gonna be significantly better in terms of power handling. It might have slightly better transient. Well, it's going to have slightly better efficiency because this is on the ISL 6617. So you're going to get slightly more efficient VRM, but the heat sinks have gotten, if anything, kind of smaller with the addition of the heat pipe. The memory topology is the same. You've got the same number of SATA ports. The rear IO is the same. And I guess you've added now a X16 PCIe slot that's potentially PCIe 4.0 compatible. But the thing is, like with the PCIe 4.0 thing, None of the, like, none of the 10th gen CPUs support PCIe 4.0 anyway, so it's just like, why are you buying a Z490 motherboard for an 11th gen CPU? Like, come on, right? Like, um, so that, that also just doesn't make a lot of sense to me, is, like, so I wasn't really considering PCIe 4.0 support as, as a criteria much either, um, because it's just like, well, 10th gen doesn't actually support it anyway. And, like, I, I don't know how many, like, how many people, and, like, 11th gen, I'm not sure that many, that, like, that many people are going to be interested in upgrading to it, and, yeah, it's just, um, uh, so I don't know why you'd get this, because the Gaming Edge Wi-Fi is basically this for $50 less, and same goes for the Dash F, is, uh, you could just get a Gaming Edge Wi-Fi for $50 less. And actually, this has a worse VRM than the, the other two boards here. I, uh, no, worse VRM than MSI. Well, not in terms of... Actually, no, it, worse than Gigabyte as well, because th this is on 55s, which it could be 60s. Like, if this is on SIC 620As, then that would be 60. Like, I'm not sure... Like, the funny thing about the, the 60 amp and, like, the really high current power stages is that they don't normally have their data sheets specking out all the way to the peak current, like, to the rate, like, name nominal current. They normally spec out to, like, reasonable currents that you would actually reasonably be expected to be able to cool. And so, like, a 60 amp power stage... It's really reg normal to finish the, like, the data sheet finishes the efficiency curves and heat dissipation curves at 55 amps because even 55 amps is kind of ridiculous to run into a 60 amp power, through a 60 amp power stage. Um, and then when you get, to, when you get to, like, the 70 amp smart power stages or the 90 amp smart power stages, they all stop at 60 amps because it doesn't matter how efficient your component is, is 90 amps out, like 90 amps flowing through the power stage is going to produce so much bloody heat that while technically it might be, you know, supported, realistically, you're never going to want to do that. Okay. Like you're just not a realistic usage scenario. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if they're going by where the efficiency curve ends, because if this is based on where the efficiency curve ends, then yeah, that, then the SIC, uh, the SIC 620A is a 55 amp part. Anyway, this is on 50 amp or 45 amp parts, and it only has 12 power stages, which means power delivery wise, it's about the same as this board. But uh, of course, the, the 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 thing is like, yeah. So I, I don't see a lot of reason to to like. So VRM wise, this is actually weaker than even like the gaming edge Wi-Fi because that's on 60s, and this is a six phase. This this doesn't even have that high a phase count because it's Asus, right? They they don't actually use high phase count. Uh, they don't use doublers. Anyway, um, not that it really means anything, like, you have 12 power stages, you're still going to get a lot of current handling capability, but, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is, like, so why would I get this instead of a Gaming Edge Wi-Fi, or why would I get this instead of a Z490 Vision G, or even a Z490 Elite, which I, I don't have it in the list here, which, 
you know what, let's go grab the Elite as well. Um, because the Elite, like, the problem I have, like, the Elite is very simple for why it didn't get in. So, the, where is the Elite? AC, no, I want the non-Wi-Fi Elite, because the Wi-Fi Elite is even more expensive and therefore even less justifiable, in my opinion. Because, again, if you want Wi-Fi, Gaming Edge Wi-Fi. Because <laughs> the other thing is, like, the AC gaming, the Elite AC is on uh, Wi-Fi 5. It's not on Wi-Fi 6. But anyway, so Dash F, uh, yeah, I, I don't know why you'd get this over the $200 boards. Tough Gaming, this didn't make it into, this is a $200 board. This didn't make it into the list because this is the rear I.O. Like, it's an ATX motherboard. Where the hell are my USB ports, Asus? What did you do with them? Right? And it's not like we have some crazy configuration of internal USB port headers to c compensate. Because we've got one 3.0 over there. And uh, that type, like that, uh, whatever the hell that is. You know, the, 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 like the faster USB port that I don't actually care for the name. Like you have that one. So you have that and that. But that is, I think think pretty yeah like you also have that on the elite and the elite gives you uh, better rear io but this didn't make it onto the list because the vision g has an even better rear io than this because the vision g takes this rear io adds uh adds a ps2 port to it you still only get two and a half gig though this is two and a half gig real tech whereas the um where does it say two well this is two and a half gig real tech whereas the um uh, what's it called the vision g is on two and a half gig intel um but either way like the the, the thing the funny thing about the two and a half gig nix is like as far as i'm aware there's some kind of bug with the two and a half gig intel whereas the real tech two and a half gig is actually like like it works okay um from what i what i've been told i don't really have a test for that so yeah, either way, like, this didn't make it onto the list because the rear I.O. is worse than the Vision G. It has less PCIe X16 slots than the Vision G. And then other than that, it has the same power delivery as the Vision G. And, like, it, basically, this is a Vision G with less connectivity options. So I was like, so why would you get this instead of the Vision G? Right, that's that's my main, uh, my, my main question there. Let's see, 490. Um, yeah. I just wanted to check if the yeah no you still get even that you know the the fast front panel usb port so um yeah it's like i have no idea why you would get the 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 elite like well no i i could totally see like if you don't care about the extra additions that the vision g has and you can't find a vision g in stock then sure get an elite or if you just don't, or you think the Elite looks better or whatever, get an Elite. I don't see a problem with that. The tough, though, is like you're straight up giving up USB ports for no good reason. Also, you have these stupid SATA ports that stick straight up out of the board um, on the bottom edge instead of having them along, you know, normally along the edge. Um, I'm assuming these are cheaper. <laughs> Actually, not assuming. They're definitely cheaper. That's why they're on the low-end boards. Um... Yeah, and then, then VRM-wise, this actually is cutting down the capacitor configuration quite significantly. You might notice that the socket is pretty empty, and also the bulk caps have kind of gone missing. And so it's like, yeah, I, I wouldn't go for this instead of, like, the MSI or the Gigabyte boards here, because um, they're not doing any kind of, like, significant cutting down, right? Like, Gigabyte full has the full capacitor array that you'd normally get, even on more expensive... Uh, right, that's the Ultra... The, the Elite still has the same, like, bulk capacitor array. The the tantalums are gone behind the socket. Those are gone. But the, the capacitor array is still the same. So, yeah, I, I feel like this board is just kind of shaving off too many bits and pieces. Also, this doesn't have BIOS flashback. This has BIOS flashback. The Vision G has BIOS flashback. Like, so, yeah, you know, it's... Uh, it's that's kind of that. That's That's why these boards didn't make it into the list. Um, and also, I just realized this video is 43 minutes long. Well, that's fine. Like, you know, there was a lot to talk about. But 
So boards that I really regret that they didn't make it. So like the $250 boards not making it, I stand by that. I, I don't see a reason to get a $250 E490 board. $300 E490? Sure. $200 E490? Absolutely. $250 E490? Dumb. <laughs> like, like literally it's just like these boards are dumb. They're this weird middle ground between the $300 boards and the $200 boards where they're significantly more expensive than the $200 boards without doing significantly more, and they're significantly cut down compared to the $300 boards, at least in my opinion, because with the $300 boards, at least you get, like, a postcode, right? And uh, on a lot of them, you get, like, really nice power delivery and, and that kind of... Like, that, the, like $300 is where you start seeing the really nice power delivery, the postcodes, and, like, heavy overclocking focus. But the thing is, like, if you just want basic... Like, if you just want a, a decent, solid VRM and good memory overclocking, you get that with the $200 boards already, because, like, the Elite AC, or the regular Elite, or the Vision G, they all have the same memory topology as the, AOR, as the Z490 Master. Right? Like, so, yeah. Um, that's that's kind of that. You know, I still kind of wish that Gigabyte had made a Z490 Aorus Extreme Light Edition where they got rid of the 10 gig and got rid of all of the metal. Like, literally just made this board, but naked for like five, and without the 10 gig LAN. And actually, they could probably drop the Thunderbolt, drop the 10 gig, and drop all of the heat sinks and 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 just all of the unnecessary you know aesthetics pieces because the VRM doesn't need a heat sink. Um, keep the backplate though. The backplate's good, and make it like a, an Aorus Extreme Light, which would be like a really cool Fordim OC board. And they could have like because I think if you chopped off all of the metal that the board comes with and all like the 10 gig and the Thunderbolt, you could probably get it down to around four hundred dollars in terms of price point. Because the 8-layer PCB, that shouldn't be that expensive. The SMT DIMM slots definitely not, like, shouldn't be, like, definitely not that expensive. Um, the VRM, ultimately not that expensive. Like, you can get that VRM on, uh, well, you can get those power stages on a Unify. I guess they might have had to shave off a couple of the tantalum capacitors, maybe. Like, though I would have shaved off a bunch of the through-hole ones. I kind of doubt they do anything. Um... That, that would be a fun experiment if it weren't for the fact how destructive it is to pull, like, through whole capa- Like, pulling through whole capacitors from, power like, main power planes, absolute nightmare to do. Um, but yeah, I'd assume if you dropped a bunch of the through holes on the, the Aorus Extreme, it probably wouldn't do much of anything. Um, so, yeah, they, they could have made, like, a, a light version of this board, and I would have been all over that. Because this thing, as it is, it's 800 bloody dollars, and it's just, like, it's so damn expensive. And the thing is, it, like, this is the only board in Gigabyte's entire, like, ATX motherboard lineup with a different memory topology from the master. Oh, and then there's, like, some of the really cheap boards. Like, but basically between $200 and, and the $400, all of the Gigabyte boards have the exact same memory topology and it's just like so if you just care about the memory or you don't, just don't need that much power delivery for the cpu you can literally go buy a 200 hundred dollar board and you're you're good right like um yeah and i really wish there was a way to like ha like the top half of this motherboard i wish that was more accessible the rest of it i don't care about actually no like just the the vr from the vrm to the dim slots that's the part of the board that i care about and then the rest of it we could have axed um so, yeah. Anyway, so that's it for this video. This is like all of the different boards that didn't make it. You know, no safe boot, not not in stock yet. Also, potentially just not as easy to work with as an Apex. No iGPU support. Uh, why wouldn't you just get a three hundred dollar board instead? Um, I don't know if the VRM is any good. This just isn't going to be that much better than the... Like, this isn't significantly... Like, this doesn't do anything special compared to the other three... Well, it has the tantalums in the socket. It's just like... And that is special, but I don't think it's that special. So, it's like... This is a... Bo like, there's nothing wrong with buying it. It's just like, I didn't really want... Like, Unify has freaking fail set. Like, you, fail set is awesome. So, this board was really like... I couldn't think of a reason why to include include this one. 
Um, this right here is just like, I get a gaming edge Wi-Fi instead. Get a gaming edge Wi-Fi instead. Get a gaming edge Wi-Fi instead. Or a Tomahawk. Or a, a Vision G. Or, you know, any of the other $200 boards that I recommended in the, in the Gamers Nexus video. Because... Yeah, there's, like, these. none of these are particular, like, they're not bad boards where it's, like, if you have one of these, you should go return it. It's just, like, I don't think they're the, like, I don't think they strike the best balance of features to cost. Though I still think the Ultra is really cool. Like, I, I think this board's still really cool, but I don't think it's, you know, like that much cooler than the, the competing boards at this price point. And at that point, it's, like, Eh, really hard to justify and I couldn't just include every single board because then it's like like the thing is I also need to cut down on how many boards like because the, the people want to be able to use the list to like make purchasing decisions and if I just make a list of basically every Z490 board that doesn't suck then there's going to be so many boards and it's not going to help anyone they're they're going to end up in the same situation I was in when I was making the list where it's like so um um, uh, which $300 board do I put on the list? Because <laughs> this one might have, this one's slightly better, like, transient response, probably. The Asus is probably, like, Asus has slightly more power delivery. MSI has way more power delivery, but also more OC features, but probably worse transient response. And then it's like, uh, Unify is definitely going just because I don't believe the transient response is going to be that bad. Um, and yeah, anyway, so I'll actually end the video now. So thanks for watching, like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. And if, uh, other than that there's also the HOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts stickers posters you know the usual YouTuber merch stuff um, and there's a link to that down in the description below as well so yeah that's it for the video thanks for watching and goodbye